I give the floor now to the representative of Armenia. Thank you. First of all, I should like to congratulate you, sir, on your assumption of the presidency of the Security Council for this month. We wish to thank you and the entire delegation of Jordan for excellent work done at the beginning of the year. With your permission, I shall take this opportunity to convey the sincere congratulations of Armenia to the new members of the Security Council. Mr. President, the theme of the debate is an issue that is at the very heart of our organization. It is enshrined in the preamble of the Charter, and therefore it should be more systematically integrated in the United Nations in order to prevent the conflicts and create more stable societies around the world. It is our strong conviction that solutions to conflict should impartially and fully address the root causes of conflicts in order to prevent their resurgence in the future. While acknowledging that all conflicts are different in their historical, legal, and political background, we should bear in mind positive experiences from recent examples of conflict resolution. Mr. President, we completely agree with your inquiry reflected in this debate's council paper on the role of the United Nations to forge a deeper reconciliation among peoples based on a shared narrative and memory of a troubled past. Often this process entails more than simply adopting declarations and resolutions, visiting and laying down flowers at victims' memorials, or signing agreements or protocols and shaking hands. To be lasting, reconciliation may require the setting of the past, recognition and acceptance of responsibility for committed crimes. Among the many lessons that we have come out of our own tragedy, the Armenian Genocide, we have learned, unfortunately, that a reconciliation process could be delayed for decades or even generations. This was the first modern genocide perpetrated under the cover of the First World War. It shows the extent of which humanity can degrade in the absence of an international system of security and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms. There is nothing new in stating that ending impunity for heinous mass atrocity crimes is vital for restoring justice and normalcy. This is especially relevant to the crimes and conflicts driven by extreme nationalism or ideologies. In 1939, just before the Nazi invasion of Poland, Adolf Hitler told his generals, and I quote, the aim of war is not to reach definite lines, but to annihilate the enemy physically. It is by this means that we shall obtain the vital living space that we need who today still speaks of the Armenians, end of quote. Mr. President, we also learn from the history that the scourge of war and genocide crimes repeat themselves cyclically with frightening frequency in different parts of the world, resulting in enormous loss of human lives and social, political, and regional unrest. It's up to every society to address its past crimes, and my delegation believes that there is there is also a clear role to be played by international institutions, world parliaments, human rights activists, political and religious leaders, historians, teachers, and students, and other groups and individuals to establish the true and common historical narrative. As we have noted in listening to the members of the Council and other previous speakers, one of questions that could be approached in this debate concerns the principles and instruments of seeking truth. Still, Experience had shown in different parts of the world that successful reconciled societies and nations usually undergo an extensive process of restoring justice, including reparations to victims and their heirs, in order to reestablish their national dignity and identity. It is also imperative to speak with one voice against a distortion of history, the denial of historical crimes and negationism. The legacy of past violence and human rights abuses must be addressed, and victim-centered approach is required. Mr. President, with respect to lessons learned, we are certain that prevention of conflicts and development of sufficient early warning procedures are among the most important tasks facing the international community. It is also our duty to continually convey a strong message of rejecting violence the escalating crisis situations and honoring previous commitments. In this respect, Armenia remains determined to continue its incessant search for durable 
peace exclusively through negotiations, promotion of the CBMs, and good neighbor relations based on the recognition of equal rights and self-determination of people in the volatile region of the South Caucasus. For decades, the United Nations and regional organizations have been involved in post-conflict situations in which confidence building has had to be addressed in order to overcome enmity and mistrust among those who must learn again to live together in the same neighborhood side by side. Today's debate is an important step in that direction, and we thank you, Mr. President, for this timely initiative. Appreciate your attention. Uh, Turkey aligns itself with this statement delivered earlier by the European Union, but let me make some additional remarks in my national capacity. First, I wish to express my appreciation to the Jordanian Presidency for convening this open debate on an issue of great importance for the UN and the member states. The number of speakers today is a clear, of, clear reflection of the, of the interest in this issue. I would also like to thank Under Secretary General Mr. Feldman for his briefing. Indeed, avoiding war and historical tensions, maintaining peace and achieving reconciliation are fundamental objectives of the work of the United Nations. So, we welcome the opportunity to engage in a debate on this issue. Mr. President, peace-building efforts today pertaining mostly to the development of a political, economic, security, and institutional environment conducive to the establishment of a lasting peace. But ensuring a favorable social environment is also key. As often, psychological and social factors will directly affect efforts in other areas from political to security. Parties to a conflict may have divergent historical narratives and even selective memory, polluting the social, political, and security environment, becoming an obstacle to reconciliation and contribute to relapse into conflict. In this context, along with the development in other areas, striving to reach a common historical narrative to provide local populations with a brighter, conflict and war-free future has to be pursued. <clears throat> the international community, the UN, and the regional and sub-regional organizations have a role to play in helping to forge conditions that enable reconciliation through the various instruments at their disposal, including mechanisms such as history, truth, inquiry commissions, panels, and tribunals. But in this process, the following factors must always be borne in mind. First, there are no two conflicts that are alike. The requirements for reconciliation efforts will differ according to the conflicts as well as the political, social, economic, cultural, and historical factors. While in some cases truth commissions may facilitate reconciliation, in others tribunals would be successful. Secondly, Ownership of the reconciliation process by the parties is a determining factor. Reconciliation cannot be forced and can only be sustainable with the consent of the parties. Reconciliation is a process for which the local populations bear the primary responsibility. The international community and the UN must support local reconciliation efforts, but it should not attempt to act as a substitute. In this context, the United Nations is an important actor possessing the legitimacy, capability, and experience to assist pro providing technical support mechanisms and agreements that are required to be the basis of reconciliation processes. The UN and the international community should provide the necessary political, financial, and logistical support for the mechanisms that can help achieve reconciliation in the pursuit of lasting peace. Thirdly, parties should be enabled to meet on a common objective historical ground. The establishment of historical facts through scientific means, such as impartial and objective historical commissions that may be formed by the parties or even with the participation of third parties, can be very useful to lay an event, even common ground on which reconciliation can be built. In this context, the proposals in the concept note of the Jordanian presidency are noteworthy. 
the establishment of UN historical advisory teams to assist local authorities in securing documents and archives, archives could be useful. Additionally, UN assistance in building local capacities for national archives or national historical commissions where necessary could also be beneficial. They would help secure the necessary scientific data that could be critical in later stages in the path to establishing a common objective historical ground. Also, often, third parties play an important role. They may hold key data in their archives. The UN could assist reconciliation processes by urging third parties to unconditionally provide the relevant mechanisms which the necessary formation of an unbiased, objective, and scientific account of historical narrative. Fourth, even though establishing historical facts may be important, reconciliation should focus on the future. It is essential to create an atmosphere that promotes understanding, tolerance, and cooperation in order to achieve true reconciliation. Reconciliation must not be narrowed down to revisiting the past and be used to revive old animosities. Establishment of a positive, forward-looking agenda will be more beneficial to create a peaceful future where communities can make a fresh start. Fifth, reconciliation does not mean impunity. In order to achieve true reconciliation, those responsible for the most serious crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and war crimes must be held accountable. Sixth, it must always be remembered that reconciliation is mostly a long-term and complex process. We must not give up efforts at the first sight of obstacles. On this note, let me pay our tribute once again to the memory of the late President Nelson Mandela for his unrelenting efforts in pursuit of and success in achieving national reconciliation. Mr. President, as we discuss and attempt to strengthen our capacities to better deal with post-conflict factors, we should not stop to intensify efforts to prevent conflicts. We should equally strengthen all instruments at our disposal for preventing and resolving conflicts, including mediation. Mr. President, I would like to respond to the distinguished ambassador of Armenia concerning the remarks about the 1915 events. As it is well known, genocide is a precisely defined concept in international law, and its proof requires high standards of evidence. That's why this concept must not be used lightly to promote spurious historical narratives. On the other hand, allegations of genocide regarding the 1915 events have never been legally or historically been substantiated. In this same way, there is neither political or legal consensus as to the nature of those events. Within this context, it is important as it is, memory does not constitute reality on its own. Often, as is in the case of the controversy between, controversy between Turks and Armenians regarding the painful part of their common past, national memories can clash. We believe that driving animosity from history by trying to imprint on others an incriminating and one-sided view of the past and calling for selective compassion is not the proper way of respecting the memory of many Turks, Armenians, and other who, others who lost their lives during the First World War. It is therefore important to face history in its entirety and through impartial scientific examination of historical records and archives so that the right lessons may be drawn from history and the common fair memory can be reached. I believe that today's open debate aims at meaningful reconciliation based on shared historical understanding helping to cement lasting peace. That's why we need to help forge an agreed and shared narrative, a shared memory of a troubled past, rather than sharpening one side narratives. We continue to seek an open and honest dialogue with Armenia. We hope that Armenia seizes its historic opportunity to replace the language of subjective conviction with the language of objective language, uh, knowledge. Thank you, Mr. President. Having followed the discussions that involved uh, in a constructive manner, 
which is particularly appreciated given the participation of countries that are not often in agreement with each other. One cannot but regret the continuation of the policy of negation by Turkey and its unchanged rhetoric. Allow me to touch upon briefly the misinterpretations that we heard from the distinguished representative ambassador of Turkey on the issue of Armenian genocide. I think delegations present in this chamber feel surprised to hear the distorted explanations about the un undeniable fact of the Armenian genocide which took the lives of one and a half million Armenians, Armenian children, women and men, living in the Ottoman Empire during the regime of young Turks. Let me refresh the memory of the representative of Turkey in particular. It began in April 24th in 1915 and went on until 1923. The systematic and planned slaughter of the entire nation. It is defined as genocide and it is called Armenian genocide. It began on that fateful day, Mr. President, when the Ottoman Turks round up 300 Armenian leaders in the Constantinople. These community leaders, writers, philosophers, professionals were executed. On the same day, 5,000 of the poorest Armenians were butchered in the streets of the city. Then the brutal executions spread to the whole Armenian community in Anatolia. Deportations and killings were carried out. There were death marches through the deserts and the mass killings of people condemned by the representatives of British, French, Russian, German, Austrian government stationed in Turkey. This crime has been recognized by a number of member states and international organizations, including the United Nations and its Commission on Human Rights and its subsidiary body of the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. Mr. President, the reason why we are particularly sensitive to this subject is that the policy of genocide carried out by the Ottoman Empire culminated in indiscriminate extermination and slaughter of Armenians has gone unrecognized by Turkey, despite the efforts of the international community to reinstate and recognize that crime. I just want to tell the representative of Turkey that it is time to realize, and this is why this thematic debate has convened here, that in order to be part of civilized world, one should avoid negationism and not resort to denial of historical facts in order to conceal the past injustices, particularly committed mass atrocity crimes. In concluding, Mr. President, Armenia believes that recognition of Armenian genocide by Turkey would lead to the abolition of psychological barriers between our nations. As we approach the centennial commemoration of this crime in 2015, we call upon United Nations, member states, other international organizations, civil society groups to continue taking appropriate steps and actions aimed at recognition of that crime against humanity in order to prevent its horrendous repetition in other parts of the world. Thank you. Today's meeting somehow indicated that the purpose was not to somehow revive the past uh, conflicts between the nations, rather than it was aimed to find somehow compromise between the nations for, for the future of the world. We, we came to this meeting with this understanding. So we did not want to discuss the past events of uh, centuries ago. But it seems like that we have some different interpretations of the past. I think it's quite natural that some other delegations have different interpretations of the events in the past. And I think uh, the issue that Armenian delegation has uh, uh, raised is one of those issues. It's obvious that we have different interpretation of those events. We did not say that nothing happened in 1915. We know those events, but the definition of those events does not fit into the today's description of, of, of the genocide, which was defined in the Convention of 1948. So as we look at the 
uh, examples of the uh, resolutions uh, and, and the decisions of the international courts, we could see that it's, it's, a, it's a crime. It's well-defined, precisely defined, and it requires high standards of proof. So let me give you an example. Let's look at Bosnia and Herzegovina. The International Court of Justice delivered its decision and said that there was a genocide in, in Srebrenica. But the, the court could not establish such a crime in other parts of the Bosnia Herzegovina. So what was the reason for that? Because the court could not find enough evidence for those events uh, which took place in other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. And these events took place in our time. We all witnessed these events. In such a time, we have the technology, TV, and all kinds of communications. The court could not prove that it was genocide in other parts of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now, a delegation is raising that 1915 events are genocide if in the absence of any resolution or any decision of international court. So how do you expect us to accept these prejudices? So, uh, but we should not be the hostage of the past. We should look at the future. We believe that if we look at the future, we can come over the difficulties that we had in the past, and we can give hand in hand and look at the future and come to a compromise, and uh, we can live peacefully together. That's why we would like to recall once again that we should not be uh, taken hostage our future to the uh, events of a century ago. Thank you.